Good afternoon, Bob. How are you doing? Great. Good afternoon, David. Well, Bob, it's so good to see you. And pursuant to your induction into the TCDLA Hall of Fame, we're here to memorialize that event and preserve the oral history surrounding your Hall of Fame induction, your presidency, you were the 30th president from 2000 to 2001. So we're going to have a little conversation this afternoon. Firstly, congratulations, a well-deserved honor. And thank you, sir. Wonderful honor. And secondly, thank you for agreeing to preserve your memories about TCDLA and your life. That's wonderful. Okay. Let's, uh, let me go back and start with the beginning. Tell, because people will be watching this, they need to know a little bit about you as a person. Where were you born and raised and go to school? I was born and raised in Madison County, Tennessee, in Jackson, Tennessee, as were my parents and both sides' grandparents. The same doctor who delivered me delivered my mother. My mother and I had the same sixth grade teacher, and she said she was a battle axe when she had her. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we moved away from there to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and spent four years there. My dad ran a liaison between the Commonwealth Government of Puerto Rico and American industry to try to industrialize the island. And we were there until Cuba got to be such an issue at Castro, and we moved back, or at least the family moved back. My dad stayed there for a while, but he got to be, when you saw Russian warships right off the uh, on the horizon coming around Puerto Rico, it was time my dad decided to move us back. And we ended back up in Tennessee, then Atlanta, and then in 1962, his job transferred him to Dallas. So I've been in Dallas since the ninth grade, 1962. Okay. And you're still in Dallas. And still, I, still practicing? Still practicing. Excellent. Hope Trying to get it right. <laughs> always have, my friend. Always have, you have. So when you, you went to high school in Dallas. Yes. And then you went to college. Yes. And where did you go to college? Texas Tech University. All right, the Red Raiders. Lower Texas, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think your boys went to Texas Tech. Too. My older boy went to, he, older boy Rob started at Samford University in Birmingham. Decided after two years that the girls there really were Baptist. So he transferred to Texas Tech and got a, a very fine business education. And then he went to graduate school in Los Angeles at the Musicians Institute of Hollywood. Spent three and a half years there, and then we moved him to Austin in 2004, where he runs our recording studio complex in Del Valley. And, and during your tenure and your involvement with TCDLA, and I know we're getting ahead of us, but, but you always had the boys involved with TCDLA. Well, they grew up in TCDLA. I, I, I love them. They, they grew up with you, they grew up with the high schools, they grew up with uh, the Gorensons, and it was just, a vacation meant TCDLA trips to them. A lot of good trips to the Oh years. yes, oh yes. Okay, well let's go back. Okay, so, so she went to college, and what, what did you major in? Well, I started majoring in chemistry. To go actually, to dental school. I actually knew that. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Tell us yes. the story. Well, um, organic chemistry and I did not get along well. I can well understand that. And uh, so I realized that I wasn't going to be able to get into Baylor Dental School. So I went to the psychology department and took a battery of aptitude and placement testing. And when the results came back, medicine wasn't all bad. Okay. And the first thing was, as you heard yesterday, evangelism. And I said, I'm not Elmer Gantry. The second one was mortician. And I said, I'd hate doing that. And the third was trial law. So I went to the University of Houston School of Law. But if you think about it, they're all three about the same. All three of those professions are selling heaping platters of horseshit. Unsuspecting, <laughs> unsuspecting people. So uh, I, I went to University of Houston Law School and and I had a great time working. I sold lady shoes at Neiman's at Galleria, uh, straight 9% commission, made a lot of money. Cool. And, uh, and I got about a 70% decrease in income to become an assistant district attorney <laughs> in Dallas <laughs> in April of 1973. And that was Henry Wade as yes. the elected district attorney. Yes, time. yes. And, and, and some people, Henry was a very fine gentleman. I think everybody would agree on that. Yes. Uh, not only a gentleman, but, but a, a, a very fine attorney. 
And I think a former FBI agent. Was yes. Okay. Uh, he got into it with Hoover. He called J. Edgar Hoover out on something. And as a result, the rest of their lives, they were mortal enemies. And so how long were you in the DA's office? In that Four and a half way? years. Four and a half years until the end of August of 2000, I mean, 1978, when, um, and I have said this before, I had tried a case or two with Phil Burles. Very, very, very well respected. Well, he time. was just a lawyer's lawyer, and he told me, he says, when you're ready to leave the DA's office, call me. So in uh, August of 77, my older boy was one year old, and I needed to make more money than they could pay me at the DA's office, and so I called Phil. And Phil happened to be in the jury trial of T. Cullen Davis in Amarillo at the time. Okay. And he flew in for the weekend, took me to lunch, and offered me a, a position that I wasn't expecting. I thought I was going to be a salaried employee. It was a lot worse than that. I was a non-salaried partner. <laughs> but the problems were not at all what I thought they would be because he's off fighting the T. Cullen Davis wars. The phone is ringing off the hook in Dallas, and there's nobody to answer the phone but me. What a wonderful way to start in a private practice. Well, it was unbelievable because I, I made more between August, or the end of August and end of December, by far than I made in four and a half years in the DA's office. And it just got better from there. He was a really fine, fine lawyer. He was Emmett's friend. He was Frank Smith, Frank's friend, and he uh, was just a lawyer's lawyer. And he took me under his wing and, and uh, I guess did be a good Good deed. He's also a very good businessman, from what I understand to be. He, Unlike Mr. Colvin. <laughs> well, he is. He was a businessman. He was a very fine businessman. He was, to a fault, trusting and honest. And I say that to a fault because some lawyers took advantage of him. And it, it broke my heart. And when he stopped practicing, I left that firm and started on my own little office where I've been since 92. So you were with Phil then from, if I, 78, 79 to 92? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about how and when you got involved in TCDI. Well, when, when Phil brought me on board, he said, there are two things that I really want you to do, and that's be very active in the, the state bar and in the Dallas bar, and be very active in TCDLA. As you know, Phil was one of the founders he was third president, and uh, it was just the very first trip I went on was to Cancun. Uh, that's where I got to know Jerry Goldstein and Chrissy and all of these people that were the most wonderful people who today are just the, the still the most wonderful people. And it's just been a, a wonderful trip since then. Uh, and as we were saying earlier, during those years, we passed the hat to pay the light bill for TCDLA. And now, with, uh, with the executive director that we have and the wonderful staff that we have, it's an altogether different organization, much, much, much better. But the camaraderie is the same. I don't think the civil practitioners enjoy such a camaraderie. I think that's a really fair statement, and this organization, I know, has meant everything to you. Yes. As it has to most of us that have been involved for 20 or 30 or 40 years. Yes. Without it, we would not be the people we are today, and we would not be the lawyers we are today. And, and I'm sure you'd agree with that. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the best turning points in this organization was the year that you ran for president. <laughs> because it's never happened before that we had back-to-back -back Austin presidents. But Jerry Morris... And you were back-to-back -back Austin presidents at a crucial turning point in the development of this organization. As you will recall, we had real problems in management. We had a real tough transition. And it has, had we not had the two of you as back-to-back Austin-based lawyer presidents, I don't think we'd have made it as well as we did. Yeah, you're gracious to say that, and, and I'm not sure I had anything to do with that, but I know Jerry picked up the ball where I left off, and he's, he's a very close friend and was a great president, member of the Hall of Fame, as are, are you. you. Well, I think that might have made a mistake on that. No. Nope. that as it may. You are, uh, unless I'm mistaken, the 81st member of the Hall of Fame. So that's what they tell me. That's what I told you. 
How do you feel about that? I'm just overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. I just, uh, it's the best, greatest honor that I have ever had or that anybody in my position could have. I don't think there's anything better than that. To be honored by my peers uh, and, to, and to be involved in an organization with the people, uh, the first 80 of the inductees, it's just unbelievable. Given that we've been in existence 48 years, uh, there's not a lot of us that are in the Hall of Fame. There'll be more every year. But, That's uh, right. It is, uh, I'm so happy and proud for you. Well, thank you, sir. You deserve I am it. Too. You I deserve am too. it. Now, I want to talk to you about not just as a member of the Hall of Fame and not just as a member of TCDLA, you've been a prosecutor and a defense attorney. To the youngsters that are coming out of law school, that maybe don't know what they want to do and don't maybe even have the economic wherewithal to do what they want to do. What advice would you give them about going into criminal law? To be respectful for the system and to do the best that he or she can do, whether it's as a prosecutor or a defense lawyer. I think it's really important if anybody who wanted to be a criminal practitioner at some point could start as a prosecutor. You, you make your mistakes on the county's dime and you learn how to try cases. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn how to handle the jury, learn what to do in the courtroom. You uh, tried, what, maybe 250, 300 jury trials as a prosecutor? Yes, I did. That's an incredible amount of trials, isn't it? Well, we were in trial every week, and we tried to be in trial every week. We wanted to be in trial every week. Uh, and uh, it was it was a different time then. You know, Mr. Wade, who has, caught some very unwarranted criticism because over the years there have been so many exonerees from Dallas County, but the truth is the reason there are so many exonerees from wrongful convictions out of Dallas County is because in the beginning, in the 50s, Mr. Wade and Charles Petty, Dr. Petty, who was our chief medical examiner, got together and they decided to put together the state-of-the-art forensic science laboratory. And they did that. And they maintained every piece of evidence from every vicious offense. And so when DNA came into existence, Dallas County was the only county that had material that DNA testing could be made on those old, old convictions. That's not what the press has said, and that's not what a lot of people on the street have said. They said, well, Mr. Wade wanted you to have a conviction at any cost. There's nothing further from the truth. And I've got a real fun story to tell you. I was bright, brand new into the DA's office, and I'd inherited a caseload in County Criminal Court Number One, Judge Ben Ellis's court, <laughs> which is the best place to be. He was a great teacher, mm -hmm. and Mike McCullum was McCullum was my chief, and I'm a green number three, and I'm preparing cases for trial, and I prepare. I'm looking at some case that's set for trial the next week or so. And it just didn't add up. It just didn't add up. Uh, it wasn't a DWI, it wasn't a possession case, it was something assaulted or something. So I asked Mike McCollum, I said, Mike, I, I don't believe in this case that's set for trial next week. He said, well, go talk to Wilson Johnston, was the head of the misdemeanor section at that time, and see what he says. And I went, Mr. Johnston was on vacation, came back, told Mike that. He said, well, then go talk to Mr. Wade. I said, talk to Mr. Wade? about a case that I don't believe in? He says, yeah, hell yeah. So I go up there and he had an open door policy. You just walk to the open door and you say, Chief, I need to talk to you. And he'd roll the cigar around in his mouth and he'd say, what do you want, Bob? And I said, well, I've got this case I'm working up for trial next week and it doesn't add up. He says, it doesn't add up, Bob. Huh? I said, no. He says, you don't believe in the case? No. He says, Bob, do you have your bar card with you? And I thought, this is going to be the shortest career in history. So I keep my cards, and if I have a dollar, in something like this. And so I pulled it out, and I went through, and I got, he said, hand me your bar card. And I said, here, Chief, here's my bar card. And he pulled out his wallet, he pulled out his bar card, and he looked at them both and said, it looks just like mine. Do what you think's right. Great story. And that's the way, and another example that, he called me in one time and said, I want you to bring me this beef sheet on this guy. It's a DWI. I took it in there. He said, well, this is a neighbor of mine. 
He's a good friend. He has a farm next to my farm in Rockwall County. I let his cows meadow come into my meadow. And uh, he says he's got a DWI. He's a World War II vet and a good guy. He lives over here in Lakewood. And uh, I told him I'd take a look at that case, see if I couldn't do it for some good. So he looks at the beef sheet and he says, Bob, what would you recommend on this? And I said something like 30 days probated for a year and a hundred dollar fine. He says, okay. So he called his secretary to send the fella in. And the fella came in and he introduced me to this guy who had the DWI. And he says, uh, I've worked out something for you. You can have a plea of a year, probate, or 30 days probated for a year and three hundred dollar fine. And he was overjoyed. He was overjoyed. He said, Bob, can you take him down to the courtroom and take care of this case right now? I said, yes, I did. That's the kind of thing Henry Wade was all about. Ain't no skeletons in his closet. He hadn't got a closet. He was just honest as he could be and a good guy. I mean, he was top of his class at UT and just smart as a whip and just a good old person. Gave me a lot of opportunities. You know, you, you talked about that and, and his honesty and integrity Dallas's pres preservation of the that evidence that has allowed DNA testing to show that there were wrongful convictions. That's back in the days. Not only was there not any DNA, but like on a rape case, you might have a secretor versus a non-secretor, yes, or maybe just a blood type, yes. And the dangers of cross-racial misidentification were not known. Those are all things that contributed to. Inaccurate convictions. We I mean, shouldn't really say wrongful because prosecutors weren't doing wrong things in Dallas. Yes. You weren't taught to do wrong things in Dallas by that office at all, were you? No, no. Okay. But it does it does show the evolution of science and the law. And from what we're learning from the seminar, you'd agree with me. It's so much more technical and forensic. Oh gosh, we couldn't spell DNA back then. <laughs> True. I guess we first got DNA. What, about 1989, 1990, it was just, just kind of percolating? About Is that, about that time, about O.J. Simpson time. And um, it was, you know, Barry Sheck was the key to it, and probably still is. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's a different deal now, different deal. But we also have different jury pools in Dallas than we did back then. Demographics have changed, haven't they? Oh, you did, you, I mean... You don't have to own property in Dallas County to be called up on a jury now. And it's a different deal altogether. Uh, when Mr. Wade was the most politically prominent and trusted person in law enforcement in North Central Texas, if a jury came down there and a prosecutor said, I work for Mr. Wade, they believed you. They believed that what you were going to tell them was true, and it was, to the best of our knowledge. It really was. But it was a different time. Is there a particular case that, uh, during your time frame as a prosecutor, that uh, you want to share the experience with us about? I'm going to ask you the same as a defense counsel, okay? But but well, because you've been on both sides, I got to be equal. Something comes to mind now because of something that Ron Gorenson reminded me of yesterday, and that was an aggravated sex assault of a child that was. I was assigned to prosecute. The defendant was represented by Ron Gordonson and Frank Jackson. And he was... Two members of the Hall of Fame. That's right. That's right. Excuse me for interrupting. That's exactly right. And uh, this defendant was a business executive who had his own company and it had to do with computer programming and blah, 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 all that stuff. And this is back in 75. And... Uh, Identification was a real issue in this case. Uh, a young girl, high school girl, was standing on the street corner in Dallas selling Tyler Roses. And she was abducted by a guy in a red Mustang convertible and taken to a secluded area and raped at gunpoint and then dropped out of the car. And it was a cold case. Until about six months later, she's selling Tyler Roses on the same street corner and she sees the same guy stopped at the light in a different car. And so she calls police, she gets a tag number on the car, they run it back to this guy. His name was Larry Hymendinger. How about that? Can you go to Central Casting and get a better name? Larry Hymendinger. So 
he had an ironclad alibi. You know, Frank Jackson had a three-ring notebook of defensive stuff that a show dog couldn't jump over. And the alibi was that he, under his password, was logged into a computer in Galveston that processed all of his, his computer stuff. And he was logged in from this o'clock to this o'clock, and the rape happened in this o'clock, right in the middle of it. Ironclad alibi. And I thought, this isn't right. This isn't right because we had found an, an extraneous offense on him that we prosecuted later, but, but we knew this was the right guy. So my investigator got on the telephone and found this guy in Galveston who operates this system. And he said, you're looking at a, uh, it looks like a phone bill that shows that he was online from this time to this time. And that's the alibi? Yeah. He said, that's not what that's talking about. That's when our computer processed his program. He had put it into the process long before that. So I said, get on the first plane tomorrow morning to Dallas. And he did. And we put him on the stand and it killed him. It killed him. So back then, you know, when they took him out of the courtroom after he got convicted and got 45 years or 50 years or whatever it was, they brought him back down. We found another cold case on the same guy in a different car. And we ran the car back to his then mother-in-law and tried him on, we were about to try him on that when he pled guilty to something. But back then they didn't have those flip-flop shower shoes on inmates. He would come down with his jumpsuit issued by the jail and brogue wing tips. <laughs> and, and so he, he goes to prison and he serves his time. And they almost never let him out of diagnostic because they needed their computerized system revamped and he did it. So finally, he gets paroled. All of a sudden, I get a phone call from Heimendinger. He lived up in the Pacific Northwest. He said, do you remember who I am? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm on parole now. I have a new wife, a new family, and a, a new business, and things are going well. I just want to call and let you know that I really appreciate what you did. You turned my life around. I said, okay. <laughs> so he says, you know, one of my hobbies is I make wooden boxes. I'm going to make you a wooden box and send it to you. Okay. He says, also, one of the things I do is I make confection things. I make fudge and stuff like that. And I'm going to fill that box full of fudge. I said, okay. So, sure enough, here it comes. I get a beautiful rosewood handmade box with a, a brass hinge on it, and it's full of handmade chocolates. I let my staff try the chocolates first. <laughs> <laughs> And they were okay. But his ulterior motive turned out to be that he wanted to get a pardon. And he wanted me to say something nice about the guy. So I did. You know, I did. I wrote a letter saying he paid his price and this, that, and the other. And he's, every few years, he's come back to me saying, would you do it again? Sure. Would you do it again? Sure. Would you do it again? Sure. He hasn't gotten pardoned. Mm -hmm. And I doubt that it's going to happen. But he turned himself around. He really did, but uh, Larry Heimendinger. That is a name I, I, I can understand why you never forget. Yeah. Particularly in that kind of case. Yeah. Okay. And, and so that's one that stands out. That was fun because Art Caps was my investigator at that time in the DA's office. He did some fabulous work and we, we, we kicked some ass. It was really good. It was really good. In the time frame you're at the DA's office, is, it, is my memory accurate that there were three prosecutors assigned to each court? Yes, yes. And so the three of you would work and, and one would cut the jury and the other's preparing and the, the third is preparing for the next case and, and it would rotate around like that? Exactly. As a matter of fact, five and a half months right out of law school, I was in Judge Ben Ellis' county criminal court. Mm -hmm. We would have one jury in the jury box, one jury in the hall, and one jury in the jury room. For five and a half months, we tried cases, cases, cases. He moved them, and it was great. And then uh, I was assigned to felony court after five and a half months, and spent four years in felony court. And uh, it was it was a great experience. It was a great experience. And the nice thing about that is, you can try a case with a fine defense lawyer on the other side, and you can just go at it, and then go have a beer. And cross the street and back to the that's courthouse. That's right. And the prosecutor today is the defense lawyer or the judge tomorrow. 
and there was a, a camaraderie. Of course, there were two women, two females in the DA's office at that time. Now it's probably 60%. And it was a different mix, not even different as far as camaraderie is concerned, but it was just, and I went to some civil seminars because when I was finishing law school, I was fortunate enough to have won some things, and one of them was uh, an internship at Baker Botts in Houston, and they offered me a job. And I, I thought, okay, uh, and they offered me money that I didn't know existed. And I thought, okay, and so I started going to these social events and all these things. They had little white wooden carols, floor after floor of one shell plaza. And I mean, it just, it was, I thought, I can't do this. And at these, these civil bullshit kind of civil social events, where they got a little skinny black guy in a white shirt and you walk around, you hold a cocktail and all that kind of, I said, I, I just can't do this. I'm gonna duke one of these people out. And I won't see the inside of the courtroom for three or four years. I didn't go to law school to do that. That's when I came up there and I begged Mr. Wade to give me a job. And he did, and so, but, but they don't have camaraderie in the civil bar like we do in the criminal bar, and it, it's just uh, totally different. Do you think the degree of civility between criminal defense attorneys and prosecutors back when you were a prosecutor has changed dramatically to what it is now? Uh, well, you know, there's always been that type of defense lawyer who thinks that the prosecutor's the enemy. I never thought it that way. And I never made it that way. And today, uh, it's gotten to be even more that way. And I just don't buy into that. I've never, uh, you, t you showed me a criminal defense lawyer who's a mean son of a bitch, and I'll show you one that doesn't get not guilty. Yeah. I mean, it just shouldn't be that way. And those who practice in uh, criminal defense work, uh, I just don't see that working. It doesn't work for me, uh, but it's it's, I don't know that we're as close as we used to be, although I, I love going to the courthouse and seeing those prosecutors. Yeah. But the guys and the gals and all that, you, you respect them, they respect you. If you treat them with dignity yes. and respect. Exactly. You, know, you mentioned there were only two female prosecutors back in those days. I remember Jerry Holden Meyer oh, before boy. she became a judge. She was a dear friend and, and the Iron Maiden, <laughs> she, she, was, she was a dear friend and she married uh, Jerry Meyer. I mean, she married Todd Meyer, okay. um, and uh, and that was a really interesting deal. That really was. She was a good lawyer, a good judge, and uh, a lot of fun sometimes. I only knew her as a prosecutor. I I, I went from Dallas to Austin yeah. before she became a judge. Let let me uh, let me ask you now, if I could, as a criminal defense attorney, and, and you do civil law in addition to criminal law, yes. and you are widely known and respected as the expert in terms of, of disciplinary action by the State Bar of Texas. I guess so. Well, no, we know so, and don't be bad. You've always been humble, Bob, and I respect that and admire that in you, but there's no reason to be that way here on this case today. Okay. But you are widely known as that. But whether it be in the context of a grievance or a criminal case, as a defense attorney, what is your, what is the single most case you'd like to share with us about? Oh boy, I, Richard Anderson and I were appointed by Judge Richard Mays years ago to defend a person in a capital murder, death penalty. That was an experience. That was a hell of an experience. Richard is brilliant and uh, we just, we had a hell of a time. Uh, no issue as to guilt. This is before mitigation was really quite but we put a uniformed armed guard, retired military officer who was the head of security for First National Bank on the jury. And the state couldn't understand what we were doing. Well, what the state didn't know, they didn't work hard enough to figure out was his son was doing life. So we didn't have an issue as to guilt on the case. Uh, but back then, there were the three questions that the jury had to answer, and one of them was future dangerousness. Uh, of course, uh, 
the, the Dr. Death testified for the state, uh, Dr. Jim Grigson. Now dead. Now dead, and we became very, very close friends. Uh, and uh, Richard said, uh, Bob, you cross-examine him. I said, okay. And when Dr. When he, we, Dr. Grigson was passed over to me, I said, Jim Grigson, Dr. Grigson, no questions. The best way to cross-examine him is don't. He was dangerous. Oh, God. Yeah. Dangerous. But the jury hung up 11 to 1 on future dangerousness. Hung jury. Good work. That caused the legislature to change the law so that it would be automatic life. Because we had to turn around and pick another jury. And we were six or seven weeks into the second jury selection when Norman Kenny, who was the first assistant, uh, agreed to give us six consecutive life sentences, which our client was happy to do, happy, happy to do, uh, and life without parole. So uh, obviously, in effect. But <clears throat> that was a big deal. Uh, Ron Gorenson and I have tried some federal stuff together. Very interesting stuff, very interesting stuff. And uh, as I said yesterday, uh, Kenny Johnson was referred to me by Rick Hagan and Tim Evans as a second career private investigator. He was at North Texas getting whatever courses he had to have in order to be able to get certified as a, uh, a private investigator. And he was interning for Rick Hagan. And Rick called and, and had also called Tim. Tim had used him. And I started using him, and I used him exclusively for 17 years on every case that could afford that kind of thing. And uh, we tried many, 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 many cases to a jury and never got anything but a not guilty, ever. Incredible. So, um, I, you know, it's fun to try cases that have been prepared properly, where you are walking into the courtroom more prepared than the state. That's the key to winning the case. That's though. it. That's it. You gotta work harder than they do. Yep. Hey, I kind of now you not only have to work harder, you also have to be a little lucky. Well, you got to be a lot lucky, work harder, and smart. And and, uh, and that, that's that's that was what Kenny was. And, and just the fact that he and his wife came down here from Dallas or from Arlington to attend that yesterday meant the world to Tracy and me. It was just a real special deal. He's got some health issues. It wasn't easy for him to try. And uh, so uh, that was cool. That was really neat. But Burleson was, the, he was, uh, I've tried a lot of cases with Phil, some of them pretty sophisticated federal thing. We did a, uh, a 50, it started out being a 100 count indictment in the Western District of Louisiana for uh, fraud. It was um, SBA fraud. The large, largest employer in Caddo Parish uh, was HKBB, and he was the hottest thing going financially in banking circles and insurance circles and all that kind of stuff. And he got embroiled in this small business administrative administration indictment. The indictment had to be separated into two 50 count parts, and the first 50 counts went to work, went to trial in Shreveport. We moved to Shreveport. We were in Shreveport for six months before the trial. Uh, staying at, uh, there's a Holodome Holiday Inn skirts of town behind which are condos that Mr. Beebe owned and so he put us in condos and we'd drive home on the weekends or fly home on the weekends. Mr. Burleson would, would drive home because he didn't fly, but except on occasion. But anyway, um, he taught me so much in trials of that nature about preparation. He would stay up all night long and make checklists. Dan Guthrie and I were trying the case with him. Mm -hmm. He would make checklists. We'd go by his condo early in the morning every day. He'd be asleep. He'd sleep till noon or so. And we'd pick up our checklist. And there'd be 30 or 40 things that we needed to do. And about 90% of them wouldn't net anything good, but there would be a gold nugget somewhere on there. And we worked them and we worked them. Sometimes we cussed him. But we worked them and we worked them and worked and we and we got 50 acquittals in that one. Congratulations! And it was uh, uh, we counted it as one acquittal, by the way. But, uh, oh, that's not good math. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but um, it, that's that's just the way that he was, and I was so fortunate to have had him to to learn from. And as you know from Emmett and Frank, uh, there's no substitute for a wonderful mentor. Very true. Very true. I'm going to switch gears for a second and ask you if there's a particular event or moment within your service to TCDLA that you'd like to share with, with the audience. Well, the, uh, every bit of it has been wonderful. Uh, I loved being the 30th president, and uh, yesterday was the, the top of being inducted into the Hall of Fame, of course. Uh, but there are just so many things that have gone on that have been so positive with TCDLA. You know, you get to know you. You get to know Betty Blackwell. You get to know Danny Hurley. Tim Evans came to me a long, long, long time ago and said, hey, my fraternity brother, best friend, his little brother is best friend fraternity brother with this guy called Dan Hurley, who's leaving the DA's office and he's joining... Uh, private practice, he's going to join TCDLA, uh, would you work with him, get him involved in the process? Well, that just changed life for me. Danny's the greatest lawyer, the greatest person in the world, and uh, we've been very close friends for a long time. And to see how he has developed, to see, he's on his way right now, as a matter of fact, he was in a murder case this week. He arrived last night late. Did he? Yeah, in fact, I have a picture of him trying to use a lime scooter earlier this morning. It was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have interjected that. Well, but go ahead. Uh, uh, oh, oh, uh, he and Ginger yeah. have been so very good to us. You know, we, we share a, a house up in Ridosa, mm -hmm. and we just uh, just have the best time. Tracy got with... with um, with them a year ago in March, and it kind of surprised me. We all went together to Lubbock and then drove to Ruidoso and, and had a good time together and all that. They just those relationships that were born out of TCDLA just can't be replaced. You know, Scrappy, think of that. Scrappy Holmes, Weldon Holcomb, think of those people that have meant so much to this organization. Uh, you know, without those people, we wouldn't be where we are. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's really neat. Emmett, uh, just Frank Maloney, just those are, the, those are the, the kings of our profession. Good people. Good people, no question. Jerry Goldstein, look at what he's done. Yeah. Look at what he's done. I mean, this organization gave birth to NACDL. That's correct. And, and Cynthia Orr, and look what she's done, pioneered all through this. It's just unbelievable. Uh, Cynthia just got a Court of Appeals reversal on Hurley's Dr. Dixon case. Are you? I, I was not aware of that. I hadn't seen it. Oh, it's a murder for hire. One doctor hired a hitman to kill another doctor over a girl. All in Lubbock and Amarillo. The, the killing happened in Lubbock. Mm -hmm. Danny tried that case. Danny and, and Frank Sellers tried that thing for about seven or eight months. Got a hung jury. Waited another year, tried it for seven or eight months, got a conviction. Mm -hmm. But they preserved error in areas that I would never have thought to do. And they got the Court of Appeals on Cynthia's brief to reverse on two different areas. Great. And the only the one justice says, why do we have to go to this other issue when we've already reversed the case? Mm -hmm. And it didn't because we want to answer this question right here that Cynthia had brought up from the beautiful job that uh, Frank and Danny had done in preserving air. Mm -hmm. Now that's uh, on a, a PDR. Uh, but I'll bet you a dollar that the Court of Criminal Appeals doesn't do anything. Part of the it's on state's PDR. To state's the PDR. Uh, yeah, Hopefully. state's PDR. But uh, it was a case that they preserved on, uh, there was a subpoena for the cell tower cell records, but there was not a search warrant. I remember this now. Yeah, mm -hmm. there wasn't a search warrant. So they found reversible error with that. But they went to another issue that had to do 
with the defendant's claim of a violation of his constitutional right to have an open court because Ginger Hurley was denied access to the courtroom during the final argument. When, she, when they did a bystander's bill and proved up that there was a seat, they just wouldn't let her in. And that's the way to preserve that issue, obviously. Yeah. And so, you know, things like that are just experiences that are born out of TCDLA involvement that, um, that just are priceless. They're priceless. And fortunately, this organization has become so beautifully diverse. So beautifully diverse. And it started with President 29, President 30, and President 31. Because 29 was our, Mike High School, our first black president. Mm -hmm. 31, Betty Blackwell, our first female president. And 30, our first redhead. <laughs> You know, I had to talk Betty and plead Betty to let me put get her on the officer chain, Bob. She well, you remember when she was a, she was appointed or she was nominated for uh, for uh, Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. She was on the committee and she said no. And we we can't really talk about that though. No, you but, can't. You can't. But yeah. I had the same. I had the same situation. I said hell yes. Well, you recused yourself. I recused myself. And, and you may recall that yesterday I mentioned that. I so did, nobody I would, that. would. I, I didn't know how you were going to handle that. Well, <laughs> but I appreciate it. The that. truth was a way to handle it. Yeah. Okay. If you could give uh, any advice to youngsters that are considering becoming either criminal defense attorneys or going into prosecution out of law school, would you, what would you tell them? It's not a business. It's a profession. Uh, it may or may not end up paying off financially, but if it's treated as a business, it won't be a profession. And that's what I think is the most important consideration. Uh, my granddad was a dentist. I thought I needed to be a dentist. Wasn't smart enough. But he talked to me as a little boy growing up about the difference between being a professional and being a businessman. You can run your profession with a good business ethic, but it has to be run as a profession or it's not a profession. And that, you know, I've got a lot of lawyer clients who have got baritary issues with the state bar, mm -hmm. and they just don't understand it. Well, this is a business. No, it's not. Well, this is a business. I've got to, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's a profession. You got to treat it that way. I don't believe in advertising, never did. I don't have any problem with those who do it tastefully, but I don't carry a big hammer and stand on an 18-wheeler on television, and I don't think that's the way it ought to happen. It ought to happen from word of mouth. Uh, that guy did me a good job. That, that lady did me a good job. That's Well, who do you know? Well, that's how it ought to happen, not on the side of the city bus. And I think that cheapens the profession severely, uh, but it ought to be treated as a profession and have somebody run the business office but not you and you just, if, if money starts trickling in, that's a good byproduct, but that's not what it's all about. Yeah. Well, you know, most, most criminal defense attorneys that I know are terrible businessmen. The only type of business they should be involved in other than their profession of the practice of law, in my opinion, is maybe buy an office building, but don't don't go chasing ambulances oh, and that gosh. sort of thing. It, oh, it really is distasteful. Yeah. It is sickening. Remember the uh, when you first were licensed, uh, I don't remember whether the minimum fee schedule was still in effect when, I guess that was in effect until, what, 76 or 77? You remember the state bar had a minimum they, fee schedule? Yes, yes. Never antitrust violation, but you know yeah. they were trying to make us business. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. It was just, uh, it was just unbelievable. And, and and the professional part of the IOLTA, the whole idea of a trust account. So many lawyers don't get it. Well, I don't. The lawyer would say, I don't do anything but criminal practice. All my fees are set fees. All of them are earned when received. Well, no, they're not. But you can say that all day long in your contract. That doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be interpreted. So it's not enforceable. 
Uh, and Burleson really, really impressed upon me that if it's flat fee, that's fine. It still goes into the iota. Of course, he impressed that upon me before there was an iota. It was just a regular trust account, non-interest bearing trust mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. uh, but he said the discipline of getting a nice fee, and he got nice fees, put it in the trust account and don't break it out until you earn it in incremental ways as you go along through the case. Otherwise, you're going to end up one day hungry, broke, and you've got a big case you got to work on that hadn't got any money in it. You'll, you'll then go to the next case that has new money in it, and you'll ignore this, and that isn't right. And, and uh, So that's the way we do it. I, it it caused me a problem one time though because I was hired by a corporation to bring a grievance against their prior corporate lawyer for looting the company and putting it on the brink of financial disaster. I put the flat fee in my trust account. Then I went skiing with you. <laughs> and I came back, I did all the work, I did all the work got the grievance filed, and then we went to BAM for some place. I came back, and after the first year, the first piece of mail I opened was a notice from a lawyer for a bankruptcy trustee saying, I've got to give the fee back, because the company did go into bankruptcy, and they considered it to be a preferential treatment, preferential payment. I said, well, it wasn't. It was a flat fee. They said, well, why did you put it in your trust account? Oh, gosh. Well, because that's the way I was trained to do it. It was earned, and I wouldn't have taken the case knowing that that company is on the verge of bankruptcy. Ended up, got the judge to understand where I was coming from, and he, he allowed me to have the fee. Scared the devil out of me. I had to go buy a bankruptcy code <laughs> and read it. Yeah. And there, it's a complicated code. Oh my God! Yeah, it's, it's yeah. almost as bad as the IRS code. Oh boy, they're both terrible. So Bob, as our uh, 81st inductee into the Hall of Fame, is there anything else you want to tell anybody that's going to see this that I haven't asked you about or that you haven't thought about? You got to have that opportunity to say your last final word to the audience, my friend. This organization is the greatest in the country. Uh, the more active that any lawyer can be in this organization. It pays dividends in more ways than I can describe. It, uh, you know, when my phone rings, and it's David Botsford from Austin, uh, it's one of the close friends from TCDLA, or somebody I don't know who just got my name as a Dallas lawyer out of the directory and called me. Uh, that is most of my business. That's most of my business. And it's, it's a, uh, so the, the more active that a young lawyer can be, an old lawyer can be in TCDLA, the better it is. And I love the fact that we have become more and more diverse. Uh, I, I don't like the Black Lawyers Association and the Brown Lawyers Association, the Female Lawyers Association. We're all the same. We ought to be treated the same. We ought to work the same and just look at it from the professional standpoint and not the gender or the race standpoint. And that's what this organization is so wonderful about. Bob, thank you for being here. For well, thank you for being here. Thoughts. My God, you're the only person that works the whole week down here. <laughs> no big deal. It's my pleasure and honor. And thank you so much. Well, thank you so Bob, much. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure it. and honor.